Linda, if God brings you to it, he will bring you through it. Got it? You keep thinking when it gets tough, God brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it. You know, the topic that we've got for this month, it took place this week in actuality. Now, the topic for this month, the theme was, God moves in mysterious ways. It was taken from the hymn, God moves in mysterious ways as wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the waves and he rides upon the storm. And of course, when we get into that, in May the 1st, we had Elijah and the widow. And you remember that the Elijah and the widow, a three-year um, uh, a three year drought coming, and God provided. And the ravens came with gourmet food. As Josh pointed out, the ravens get it. It's usually roadkill. However, nobody else was eating anything, but they were eating. And then on May the 8th, Bobby came, came in, and Bobby had with a spot open there. We had something planned from the same theme, and then it didn't work out. So Bobby and I were interacting, and Bobby came for a spot. So he spoke on Rejoice in the Lord Always. Now, we didn't force to put the theme into that, but anyway, Rejoice in the Lord Always was the theme for that Sunday. May the 15th, Rahab the harlot. Now, in Jesus' royal line, Rahab the harlot in Jesus' royal Are you kidding me? And yet we wonder and walk through that with Abraham Jacob. And they walked through Rahab the harlot. It's very interesting. I know the teacher comes out now and again, but anyway. In Hebrew, there's no vowels, A-E-I-O-U. Her name is really Rahab, Rahab. I went to Israel one time, I got into the bus. All my people were there, I turned to the driver and I said, what's your name? He said, David. I said, spell it for me. He said, DVD. I said, David. He said, to you is David, but to me it's Ravid. Rabid, David, no vowels. You see, but you've already got that Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. And all of these other Tamar, we call her Tamar. I've got a neighbor at the college, she's Jewish, Jewish doctor, and her name is Tamar. See, we want to make it Tamar, then we've got to put a knee on the end of that. See? So we rehab. Now, God moves in mysterious ways as wonders to perform. I got an email from George Johnson. And George said to me, since George Matthew has been sick and since he's recuperating, he has taken on more of the work that was being done by George, the other George. And so George said, you assigned me that portion about Saul of Tarsus, a wasted life, as it were, misdirected zeal. And he said, could you really list for me just some of the areas that you were thinking of, the scriptures that go with that, because I'm pushed for time. So I wrote back to him and I said to him, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to write sermon as if I were preaching it, as if I were preaching it. And so I took the thoughts that I had and I put a sermon together. I sent it to George. I said, now you can pick and choose what you like and use whatever you like, whatever you don't like, throw it away. I got a second email from George. We've all got COVID. And I said, God moves in mysterious ways. <laughs> What happened? I've got my sermon all done. I just come in and just embellished it a little bit here and there. You see, the request came, the reply came, email. 
God moves in mysterious ways. I had no idea I was preaching today until I got the email. And then he said, you may give it to somebody else. Well, if I give it to somebody else at this late date, of course, I was, wouldn't work. Now, I want you to just bear with me. I've got two cups of hot water here to try and keep the voice going. What I want to do this morning, you know what happened to Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is almost like a Jekyll and a Hyde. Saul of Tarsus comes onto the screen and onto the page through the pages, actually. And when he comes onto the scene, then he seems to be, I don't know what makes him so, so obnoxious, but it works. It was obnoxious. Then we come, after his conversion, we come to Saul of Tarsus. Not the, from the Saul of Tarsus to Paul. And what a change. So we're going back to find out what made Saul the bounty hunter that he was. He rounded up the Christians. And as he rounded up the people of the way, he gave them all, and there were, some of them were put to death and some were in prison, and he actually was the bounty hunter. So what made him the bounty hunter that he was? So we're going to look at that. Now, the life of Saul of Tarsus, just in case I make my saying, say, Paul, we're talking about Saul of Tarsus pre-conversion. You got me? So you're all with me. Saul of Tarsus was born to Orthodox Jewish parents. And these Orthodox Jewish parents wanted their son to exceed and really be something and make something of his life. Well, they were Pharisees. The Pharisees were a very strict set. The Pharisees actually had clothing, identified them, and you knew that at certain times in the day, they were going to put on a show. They were what we call in Greek, a hypocrite. And the hypocrite was, he's got all the masks in front of him, and he picks up the first mask, he puts it in front of his face, and he speaks for that mask. He puts that mask down, he picks up the second mask and he holds that and he gives you a lecture from that mask. And he does a whole drama. He's playing to the audience. He's an orator. And as an orator, he's playing to, the, get to all of the people. Well, certain times in the day, that's exactly what they did. They were all dressed. In fact, to show you how sad they were, they would darken their eyes. They didn't use mascara, but they used something like mascara and they had great black eyes. They put it in the hollows of the cheeks and it made them look like they had been suffering. Pardon me, but I am being so, so sad. And they put on the show and the people would all gather. Now this was the strictest sect, the strictest sect in Judaism. They believed in the Old Testament right down to the letter. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone through the Psalms. It says a jot and a tittle. A jot is a comma, and a tittle is a period. And God said that his word would not change. Well, they carried it out to the jot and the tittle, right to everything. They followed what the scripture said, and so on. And we're going to see some of that, something of that. So they were strict, strict, orthodox Jewish people. Well, they would take the sun with them where they weren't there, the sun started to grow. And so, Tarsus, where they lived, was a Greco Roman town. You remember when Paul got into trouble? You remember that Paul said, I'm a Jewish citizen. His parents were in a town that was Jewish, but at the same time, it was a Roman. And he said, I'm a Roman. And when they realized that they were punishing a Roman, it changed the whole thing because, no, you can't do that according to the law. And so Paul then comes, Saul of Tarsus comes into the world, a, a Greco-Roman town. It was famous actually for lumber and also for furniture. And then 
in a special cloth. Now, what your cat says, in a special cloth that was thick, it was kind of laced with oil, and it made great tents. What did Paul say it was? Saul said it was a tent maker. And so we know that that, was, that came from where they were. Now, when I was in Israel, I've been here five times, but one of the times I was there, I said I would like to go on the steps of the Apostle Paul. So we went to Greece, Turkey, followed through the steps of Paul. I said, I would like to see where Paul was born. And Saul was born. Saul and Paul are interchangeable from the Roman and the Greek, however. And he said, well, it's going to take us almost a whole day to go there and see it. You're only going to see where the town he was born. I said, forget it. And so we didn't go to Tarsus. Now, when you look at this and you think of Saul, <clears throat> highly intelligent. As a child, he was very, very highly intelligent. And it seemed to me, as a child and a youth, he excelled in actually anything that was scholastic. He was a very bright, bright child. Then he moved, when he reached a little bit older, he moved from Tarsus to Jerusalem. Now, if anybody wants to be rich, go to the Galilee. Go up with a galley, all the fishermen are and so on. But if you want to be spiritual, go to Jerusalem. And so here he is, he's gone to Jerusalem. And so he goes to Jerusalem for private schooling. And he's tutored by a man by the name of Gamaliel. Want to cut me down a wee bit, Steve, when I come close to the mic, but it's not that poor old Saul. Okay. So it comes to Gamaliel. Now, the name Gamaliel doesn't mean much to you, didn't mean much to me until you get into researching it. You see, Gamaliel, turn with me to the book of Philippians for a moment. Philippians. Now, actually, when we turn to scripture, we begin to see scripture, and we've got to turn to it to see exactly what it's saying. But Philippians 3 and verses 1, I'm going from verse 1, Philippians 3, to verses 6, 1 and 6. Now, this tells us, Philippians 3, 1 to 6. Now, this is Paul speaking, Saul, teach, Saul Paul teaching. Philippians 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Now, what he's saying is no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for such confidence. Now, he's about to tell us what he was like as a child, as a youth, as a young adult. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised in the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. So you look at him and he's saying, these are my credentials. As Saul of Tarsus, these were my credentials. And if somebody thinks they've got it all together, I've got it all together much better than they had because look at what I is all the way right through. And so we get there what his credentials were, and that was Saul's testimony. Now, there were two schools of thought in Jerusalem. Young men came. You see, we don't understand 
what takes place in Israel. I went to Israel with my brother-in-law, my two sisters, my wife and me, five of us. I heard of a school that was training and raising rabbis. I wanted to go and see it. So I was driving, so we went to the school. We arrived at a school, little boys from five years of age up to 15 years, 13, sorry, five to 13, all with the curls, they were Hasidim, set apart. They were all, there were 15 in school. They were all going to be rabbis. And so I called the guy who was over there looking after the kids in the playtime recess. And I said, I'm a teacher. My two sisters are teachers. My brother-in-law is a teacher. And my wife is married to a teacher. I said, is there any possibility we could come in and see what goes on in the school? And he looked at me, and I'm standing right at the fence. I said, and he said, no, we can't. I said, why? He said, because if you enter the school, the school will be unclean. If we enter the school, the school will be unclean. And not only that, if they could let us in, it would be the men that would go in, but the women couldn't go in. These little boys, five years up to 13, we're all going to be rabbis. They stayed at the school. The parents came to visit them. And the greatest delight was when they are graduated as a rabbi and the parents stood there just so proud. That's what's happening to Saul of Tarsus. Now, the two schools, one was, one was the, uh, of the rabbis, one was Hillel, and the other was Shammai. Now these two men, they were actually the cream of the crop of the, all of the Jewish rabbis. If you went to their school, you see, I'm standing, you're sitting. You could doze off and I'm still preaching. Well, you see, you sat at the feet of Gamaliel and you sat at the feet. He sat and he taught. Jesus went up the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration he found a level place, he sat, and he taught. The priests that were in the tabernacle, it says, this man, like the priest in the tabernacle with no seats, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice forever, talking about Jesus, sat down. See, sitting and teaching, culminating of the teaching when you're sitting down. So, I want, I want to give you a connection here. Rabbi Gamaliel was the grandson of Rabbi Hillel. Only two in Jerusalem, the schools. Saul of Tarsus is sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, whose grandfather was Hillel. Gamaliel was the grandson of Rabbi Hillel. All of these others were Pharisees. The largest sect, special dress code to be recognized, set themselves apart from the Essenes who had done the Dead Sea, the Sadducees, no resurrection, don't believe in the resurrection, and then of zealots who wanted to fight the Roman government. They were above them, and that's where... Saul is being brought up. Now, turn with me to Acts chapter 7. We're going to get into the nasty side. Acts chapter 7. The nasty side of what we see in Saul of Tarsus. This is where Paul, uh, Saul is introduced to us. So Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. Acts 7.54. That's a long chapter. Well, 54. Now, the, the, Stephen has accused the, the men, accused them all of putting Jesus to death. And Stephen is before the Sanhedrin. And before the Sanhedrin, all these Jewish men 
and then he sort and then finally he hears some rumbling going on, and he almost just got a little sudden and says, You're just like your father's. You don't listen, and you're just so stubborn, and you're so hard hearted, and it went on and on like this. This is Stephen speaking. Now, notice what they said in verse 54. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Boy, oh boy, you're going to be angry. You gnash your teeth at somebody. Look at them. When your teeth are showing, gnash their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said. I see heaven open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. So watch this. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. My cloak is going to get in the way. I'm going to take it off. Lay your clothes there. Pick up the stones. Someone picked up boulders. And when Stephen was done, they were dropping the boulders on him. He was stoned to death. Now watch what happens. They laid the feet, the clothing at the young man's feet named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. Saul of Tarsus was there giving approval to his death. Saul of Tarsus at this point is recognized as a leader. He is 30 years of age, is known to everybody as a Pharisee. He is known to one of the cream of the crop, the young rabbis that are coming up. And not only that, but here he is, and he is actually applauding them for stoning Stephen to death. Now, at this point, we take note of Saul of Tarsus. He's a leader. He's respected. He is followed. He's applauded. He had been groomed from birth to be the guardian of Judaism. He became a bounty hunter of Christians. He would go with permission to round up all those who were believers in Jesus and bring them all in. Now, he couldn't have, I don't think he was involved in their actual death other than by association. He rounded them up and he brought them in. Now, Saul's conviction was, here's his conviction. What made Saul the nasty, nasty guy? Yes, here's his conviction. Christians were heretics and the honor of Jehovah demands their extermination. Christians were heretics and the glory and the honor of God, they should be exterminated. And Saul of Tarsus felt, I've been raised from birth to be the guardian of this Jewish organization. And so he takes it upon himself to go out and exterminate him. Turn with me to Acts 9. Acts 9. Now, in Acts 9, God had called him to defend his honor. That's what he's saying. Note verses 1 through 3. Now, Saul of Tarsus, notice what it says. Meanwhile, Steve, Stephen being stoned to death a few chapters earlier. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest. Know that? He went to the high priest. And he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found any there, 
who belong to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. I'm going to leave it there for a minute because I want to come back. Verses four through six, God intervenes. Now, I want you to notice the three things. God is about to intervene in Saul's thinking. He's about to intervene, intervene in God's actions. He's about to interrupt Saul's career. God intervenes in Saul's thinking. God intercepts Saul's actions. And God interrupts Saul's career. Now look at verses 4 to 6. Verse 4. Go back to three. As he near Damascus and suddenly, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He replied. Now get up and go into the city. Now I'm Kind of a wee bit disappointed in NIV at this point. Because in the King James and other versions, it says, what do you want me to do? He says, get up and go into the city. But NIV missed that part. Very important to me to see. Immediately, he heard the voice of the Lord saying, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He was totally convicted at that very moment. They said, what do you want me to do? He's been a fighter from birth up to this point, And now all of a sudden, his life is about to change. And so God intervened in his thinking. God intercepts his actions. And God interrupted his career. Now go with me to Acts chapter 26 for a moment. Acts 26. Now in Acts chapter 26, Saul of Tarsus, we're now looking at Paul the Apostle. Everybody in Judaism wants to get a knife in his back. Everybody wants a, a piece of him. And they've all gathered together everywhere. And then, of course, when you come to Acts chapter 6, 26 rather, in Acts chapter 26, Agrippa said to Paul, Agrippa has been called, King Agrippa was visiting, and he said, by the way, he said, I've got a man in prison right now. And, you know, it seems to be that every Jew wants to get a knife into him. And he said, I, I don't know what you think of it. He said, I can't understand it. He was a Jew. And not only that, but he was a Jew that defended Judaism for years, but now they want to kill him. Why? And so King Agrippa says, oh, I'd love to see that. He said, well, if I set up a meeting with him, would you go with him one on one? He said, sure. It is. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to spend, to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I might make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have, the way I, I have lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem, they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee, and now it is, to be, it is because 
of my hope and what God had promised our fathers that I'm on trial today. This is the promise of 12 tribes and hope to be fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day after day. O king, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convicted that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now here it comes, here's the confession. And in his confession, catch it. He said, I too was convinced, verse 9, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme in my obsession against them. I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. And on one of these journeys, and then he goes in and tells me he's going to Damascus. Now, what I want you to see here. He goes on to tell him what he did. So we can see here from this, Saul's conviction was Jesus Christ comes in, acts a little. Now, I'm just going to jump towards the end. I wrote this for, as I mentioned, for George, so that I went all the places just to put together what he wants. Now, he confessed before King Agrippa his anger. I had them murdered. He witnessed his conversion to Saul as well, as to King Agrippa, rather. Now, what can we learn from this? I just want to touch on three or four things. <clears throat> First of all, we learn that we are all molded by our early life. We are all products of our childhood and the way we were brought up. I don't know that I'd be in a brethren assembly if I hadn't been in my parents were in the brethren assembly. I was in the brethren assembly all through my life. Didn't know any other churches. Went to Sunday school. We went to breaking a bread in the morning, Sunday school in the afternoon, gospel meeting at night, and that was what we did every weekend. My mother kept my brother and I in good clothes so that we wouldn't get dirty so that we wouldn't be tempted to go and play. And of course, what you did was you kept on, now that time you could get them off. And of course, my brother and I were just dying to get out there and do all things, but we had good clothes on, we couldn't do that. And you see, we are products of our environment, how we were brought up in many, many ways. Now, I want you to keep in mind that when we look at the, the life here, Although we have come into our environment, there are four parts. And those of you who have got small children, working with small children, there are four parts of that child. There's the mental, the social, the physical, and the spiritual. I have taught all my life, 40, 46 years as a teacher. I have met Christians who spiritually are a way ahead, socially misfits. Physically, uh, I don't go into sports. You see, mentally, socially, physically, and spiritual compose you, compose me. And we've got to attend to all of these and we're raising children. We raise them to do that as well. Now, the second thing I want you to notice, to live up to someone's standards is slavery. Whether it be a husband, whether it be a wife, whether it be I watched a video. I told the elders to watch this video. It's coming up. And it was about a brethren assembly that was in Dallas. And the brethren assembly in Dallas, the newspapers had gone in and found that there were one man who dominated the lives of all the people, even to the point of telling the wives to leave their husband, divorce him, because he's not belong to the body of Christ. 
He's not willing to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And I went right through that and I looked at it and it said they were known as a cult. They called it a cult. The Brethren Assembly that meets here. And of course, they went into it. And people were leaving it because one man, well, we saw that when the people were made to drink pink lemonade. We saw that done in Texas. We saw that one man dictated to the rest. And the thing is, so when you look at that, to live up to someone's standards and slavery. But if you're in a church, or you know people in a church who are living up to the dictate of that church as to how you should live, then you're in a cult. Get them out of that. That's a cult. To tell them what to do, how they do it. If they don't do it, there's penalties for not doing it. Third thing I would like you to share with you is, as humans, we are created in God's image. You are a tripartite being. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. And your body, your soul, and your spirit compose you. And you, as an individual, you were created for fellowship with God. He not only gave you a body to function in this world, he not only gave you a soul to function within yourself, but he gave you a spirit to function with him. And so you're composed of body, soul, and spirit. And you begin to feed that, you begin to grow, you begin to develop. And then the fourth point is, God is most glorified in us. I'm sorry. God is most glorified, yes, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Are you satisfied in Christ? Do you find all the things that you desire in Christ? If not, think of what John said, the Apostle John. He says, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, and the pride of life, all of these belong to the world. Are you satisfied in Christ? I came to Canada. You got away from a Christian influence in the family. I was now 20. I wanted to live my own life as I wanted to live my own life and move. And my parents gave me good wings, gave me good uh, roots. They gave me good roots. And then they gave me wings. I came to Canada. Here in Canada, I started to evaluate what I was doing with my life. I met a young lady who was my mentor. I married her 63 years later, God took her home. She sometimes said I was, she was my mentor, my first mentor. And then as I started to grow in the Lord, she said he became my tormentor. So you see, you, there's something, I'm just going to tell you one last story, and I'll close in prayer. There are two young men in this church, brothers. I was next door, youth group in there. I'm in my 30s. And these two brothers, uh, they were, they, they were very interested in spiritual things at all. And one day, both parents come in and they said, we hold you accountable for our two boys. And I said, you hold me accountable. You are the teacher. You are the model. You are the one that should be molding their lives. But the two boys were not a bit interested in spiritual things. It's not my responsibility. It was their responsibility. As parents, don't try to put your child into a mold. Don't have a mold set and you squeeze them and you push them and you pinch them and you put them into a mold. And I don't mean this to be a pun. That's what they'll become as moldy. They will actually become moldy. You look at your children and you see driving and you see enthusiasm and you see zeal in them. You see a desire for the mission. We'll encourage that. And as you encourage that, then they are not being brought up for people dictating to them. Saul of Tarsus was a monster. But when he came to Christ, 
and accepted Christ as Savior, Saul of Tarsus became the model of total commitment. You look at how many times he was taken face to face with people who were judging him. You look at all of the epistles that he wrote. You look at the missionary content, the missionary uh, trips that he took. You're seeing a man who was totally committed and for everything he did that was negative for the Christians, now as Saul, no longer Saul, but now Paul, he is the model of total commitment. He even writes at the end that he said, doesn't look good for me. I've run a good race, I've fought a good fight, but there's no light at the end of the tunnel. And he was right. You see, we've got to stop sometimes and look at the negative side of people because God moves in mysterious ways. And God moved in mysterious ways in all the lives that we have seen. And as he moved in mysterious ways, the people came out positive, committed, zeal, drive, and all that goes with Christianity and they became shining examples. So we see Saul of Tarsus, we see him now as the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles. Now, one last point. Why wouldn't, he be, why wouldn't he be a good missionary to go to the Jews? Because they saw him as a turncoat. He was one of them. Now he has turned. He's now a turncoat. And they want to see him killed. And they plan to kill him. But God keeps moving him, moving him, moving him. And then God takes him home in his time. Father, thank you for the time that we've had this morning. Thank you that we can look at people and we can see them as they actually were. And we can see the work of grace in their lives. And we can see how the Apostle Paul was turned in that moment that he heard Jesus speak to him in persecution. What do you want me to do? And from then on, a very short portion later, he was teaching and preaching. And so, Father, we just pray for the power of uh, the, the, so we see in, in Paul. We pray for some of that in our lives. That we might examine our lives to see that are we committed? Is God most glorified in us because we are most satisfied in him? We ask, Father, that you will lead us, guide us, and direct us that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Savior and put into practice what we believe. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.